I, I believe we're ready to begin. Um, the first item this morning is the invocation. Uh, I'd inter I want to introduce uh, Jason Murray, who is uh, my preacher. He's a preacher at Draper Park Christian Church, and uh, his, uh, my family and Jason's family go back um, 60 years, a long time before Jason was around. But uh, his, his, his grandparents were contemporaries of my parents, and his brother and, uh, I mean, his father and his uh, aunt and uncle were some of my dear friends growing up, and he's recently been uh, come to the pulpit at Draper Park, and I'm glad to have him here today to give the invocation. Please rise. Father in heaven, thank you for this day. This is another day that you've made, and we gratefully accept the opportunity to... Uh, to put our hand to the work you've provided. I pray your blessing on these public servants, especially for the next little while here as they work on the city's business. Thank you, Lord, and we pray and believe in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one, one nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First item on the agenda is the um, uh, uh, appointment of Sandy Myers and Mike Harris to the Civic Center Foundation. I have a motion and a second uh, to uh, confirm the appointment. Passes unanimously. Next item is the receipt and approval of the Journal of uh, uh, Minutes Council Proceedings for May 2nd and March 9th. Motion and a second to receive and approve those. Approved. The next matter is a request for uncontested continuances. Just the one that's listed on the agenda, sir. Um, at this point, we need, re we need to recess the council meeting and reconvene as the Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority for five items. Motion and a second to approve the items. Are there items to be considered individually? Hearing none, matters approved unanimously. Next, we need to, to uh, recess the adjourn the CFMA and convene as the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority for two items. Motion and a second to approve those items. Are the matters to be considered individually? Hearing none, voting passed unanimously. Adjourn the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority and reconvene the council meeting for the consent docket. A motion and a second for H. Other matters to be considered individually. Yes, H. H. Yes. Others. You guys are going to make this too easy now. Come on. <laughs> uh, we might as well start with H, then unless someone has another one. Uh, uh, this matter, of course, was uh, was on last week, and there was some issues in reference to one of the uh, the applicant's uh, properties. We have since had a uh, several conferences with the applicant and with staff, and we have come to a uh, reach the resolution of this matter. And uh, there will be, <clears throat> what we need to do is amend this to uh, two properties, one on Glen Ellen and one of the properties on Northeast 15th Street. And I believe the amount uh, was incorrect as far as the total amount of the, um, uh, the, the package initially that it was submitted, and we have an amendment to the amount, I believe. Uh, staff, could you give me that? I'm, I'm still waiting for my staff, which will take one minute. Okay. Well, if you want to, uh, Mayor, we need to just put this on hold and come back to it then. I don't want to rush in. This was a matter well, of... Russell, how long do you think this will take for them to... Um, we're just pulling out the two house numbers now, so one minute. 
Sorry. I, think, well, I, I, I apologize. I apologize. It would be easier to do it. i just wait, I think, if it's just going to be a minute. Nothing else on the consent document. Anybody want we could do that if somebody had... Or, or, have, are there comments on doing on doing this? Does anybody on the council want to comment on this? But there, there are some citizens here, if necessary. Speak. Okay. I see that uh, we have two citizens that request to speak, but Mr. Smith, you understand what we're doing? Uh, I'm not. I'm sorry. I'm not sure. Why don't you come up the microphone then? That number is... Um, 78,797. 7, okay, Go ahead. it was my understanding that we were not going to consider this proposal, but this would not affect um, the amount, and I would just select another property at a later date to substitute for this particular property. Is that a correct assumption? Well, I thought <clears throat> maybe we didn't have an understanding. I was my understanding that we were just going to remove this from the project and you would go forward with the other two projects. It doesn't, doesn't stop you from, uh, prevent you from uh, applying, you know, in the next cycle. But you know, it's well, to this. it was my understanding that um, these two properties, and when I spoke with staff, that the proposal was for a minimum of four properties, which this particular property would have satisfied that minimum. But in the absence of this property, which, you know, you have a problem with, which I understand that, uh, I would find at a later date a couple of properties that would satisfy that so that would not affect the amount of the units or the amount of the funds set aside for this proposal. Well, if, if that's the understanding, uh, I, have, I have no problems with that. And um, if, if we need to amend it to that effect, I have no problems uh, if basically <clears throat> <clears throat> allowing you to to match two other properties for the program. Staff, no. is that a problem? No. Okay. Just a, a quick question then. The uh, substitute properties <clears throat> that would be proposed at a later date would receive, would receive the same scrutiny as the, the projects originally did to make sure they qualify in every aspect with I the requirements? I think what we will do is we will confer with Councilman Kelly and make sure that those meet the, in, not only in terms of meeting the, the intent of the program, but meeting the, um, the uh, intent of uh, Councilman Kelly's objectives with the area. Okay, so that there would be a thorough review before yes. additional projects. Yes. That's, okay. All right. And, and Councilman, I, I did have a question to that number. It is actually 82,797. I'd, I'd second that, Mayor. Uh, we have, we have, everybody understand the motion is to delete the one property and reduce the amount with the understanding that Mr. Smith is going to bring a, another property back. In fact, I think it ha is going to have to bring two other properties back in order to meet the criteria. Is that right? Yeah, the other, the other property that was excluded was a duplex, so equivalent of two units. In fact, there was, there was actually room for an additional property in there. So. Depending on the value of the properties, it'll be two or three. Okay. So it will come out of this year's allocation. Yes. Won't won't have to wait. No. To do that, well, that's a good thing. Okay. So do we understand the amendment? You're, you're. Yes, we're deleting two properties, but we're not changing the amount of the award. Whatever the corrected amount of the total amount. <laughs> It was, it was 82,797. So what we'll have to do, we'll have to take that back through conservation committee and come back, okay. council again. Okay. All right. Okay. So on, on Mr. White's point, it, it the funds will be available this in, in in this fiscal year. Yes. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Uh, on, I get we have to vote on the amendment first. I have a motion and a second on the amendment. Do we? Amendment passes unanimously. 
um, we can vote on it with the rest of the consent docket as amended. Yes. A any other items on the consent docket to be discussed? Hearing none, consent docket passes unanimously. Next item is a concurrence docket. There are two items. Move the items. A motion and a second on the concurrence docket. Are there comments, questions, items to be considered separately? Concern, concurrence dockets approved. Next item is items requiring separate votes. And the first one is item A, which has uh, been continued until the 23rd of March. Um, the next one is item B. It's a ordinance on final hearing establishing no parking on 58th Street. It's in Ward 2. Yes, uh, Mayor, this is... Uh uh, a no parking stretch along the entirety of the Chesapeake's uh, development class and curve. It's the military, full length of military in Northwest 58th Street, the back side of their property, that uh, back side of theirs that fronts the uh, neighborhood. And the uh, neighborhood has requested this to continue the uh, break between the commercial development in the residential that this new, no parking restriction be in effect. So I'd move the ordinance. Uh, I'd second it, but I'd like to make a comment, please. Sure. Um, I, I, uh, normally I am opposed to uh, no parking in residential areas. I think it, it causes a hardship on the property owners. But in this particular instance, I think it's, it's uh, appropriate because it will protect the property owners from encroachment by uh, commercial the uh, attracted cars to this new uh, shopping center. And uh, this particular neighborhood has uh, uh, undergone a uh, amazing revitalization in the last couple of years. Uh, Rob Littlefield, the uh, president of the Homeowners Association out there, Property Owners Association, has done an extraordinary job. And I think anything we can do to accommodate, to protect the work that's been done out there is well worth it. And so I uh, second this motion with uh, uh, great deal of enthusiasm that we are doing the right thing to protect an area that has made a significant progress to come back as a, as a viable, viable neighborhood. Congratulations to Councilman Bowman for his leadership out there. I think it's been very important uh, to make that process work. Any further comments? I have a motion and a second to approve voting. Pass unanimously. Item C, ordinance uh, uh, concerning the uh, hot rod show have a motion? Comments? I'll move it. Motion and a second for approval. Are the comments? Voting? Passed unanimously. Uh, item D, a revocable right of way use permit on between 6th and 7th for an outdoor interdisciplinary arts performance. Uh, <clears throat> move it. I have, have a motion uh, to approve item D. Comments? Voting? Approved unanimously. Next, uh, next uh, three items uh, are uh, executive session. Now, it's my understanding that we do not need executive session on any of them. Is that right? We do not. Uh, we need a motion to strike all three. We need a motion to strike all three then, yes. I have a motion and a second. Voting. Next item is item H, claim for denial. Two items. Anyone here to speak on claims recommended for denial? Motion and a second to deny the claims. Voting. Claims are denied unanimously. Item 9, claims recommended for approval. I have a motion and a second to approve the claims. Anyone to speak? Voting. Claims are approved. Next item is item from council. Start with Councilman Mars. I'm going to set a record here. Councilman Bowman. Just a brief comment. We've all received some email information. Uh, I know the mayor's had several. Um, on this uh, request from the Department of, or Department of Architecture at University of Oklahoma 
the idea of offering through a, a student project, student of art, architects at OU, some design assistance, conceptual design assistance for looking at our health and wellness centers, MAPS 3 initiative. Very early on, granted, uh, and I understand from the mayor this has uh, been encouraged, but it's not any official endorsement or statement of the work they do, but just uh, an opportunity, a public opportunity to begin some discussion and uh, get some good heads down at OU around this. They've, they've scheduled an initial meeting for March 29th at the Plaza Courts uh, with some community participants that, would, that are interested in this concept to begin to give some uh, reaction, feedback to the students and, and professors. And I just think it's a, a wonderful opportunity to just kick this thing off, some public discussion around it. And again, nothing that at this point that's sanctioned, but they are asking our input from each of the council, suggested sites for their consideration to look at. And I think it's a good, good start. And I hope we're all willing to help in this process. Thank you. If I could just comment on that for a second. Uh, they came and approached the mayor's office in regard to that. And it's, it's just a, a class project. And, and in the past, they have done other proj class projects. An example of that is a few years ago that they looked at various sites for downtown elementary school. And we still got that, and we'll take that into consideration when we start citing that. And so they're not going to be bent out of shape if the recommendations aren't followed, but we'll, it's some information that's out there for us for consideration as we actually do our citing of those projects in the future. Councilman McAtee. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, residents of Musgrave Pennington for uh, the hospitality showed my wife and I last night uh, at their neighborhood meeting. I'd like to congratulate them on their desire to uh, uh, improve the uh, quality of life in their neighborhood by uh, putting some flags and some signage up on the new lights that are installed upon Northwest 19th Street. And also to congratulate them for their vision to uh, participate in trying to help those who are less fortunate right now by uh, making a donation for food, if that can be arranged, and uh, shows their concern for the fellow citizens. I'd like to encourage the uh, neighbors of uh, Windsor Forest to attend their neighborhood meeting uh, this coming Thursday night at 7.30. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Captain Walters. Uh, congratulations to Pudman City, Millwood, and Douglas Trojans for uh, their accomplishments in the uh, basketball championship this past week. Um, I went out to the, um, the fairgrounds Saturday night, and it was just some excellent basketball being played. And so the city of Oklahoma City should be very proud of our high school uh, sportsmanship that was displayed. Um, and last week, I would like to thank the Oklahoma City Youth Council for having me as part of their um, their program last week, and I took them on a tour of, of, of Ward 7, and, and they, were, they were very impressed with some of the features of Ward 7 and some of the history of Ward 7. And so I want to uh, thank my two councilmen, Brianna and Colin, for all the hard work that they do. And I don't know how um, they find the time to, to do what they do as far as the Oklahoma City Youth Council and still maintain the academic performance that they do in school. So we should be very proud, uh, not only for this class, but all the prior classes of the Oklahoma City Youth Council, because they represent Oklahoma City very, very well. Councilman Ryan. Uh, thank you. I'd like to say something to, to our viewing audience, I think. Um, in the last couple of weeks, the council has engaged in what I might characterize as some robust discussion on several issues. And I, um, I want to paraphrase a quote of Thomas Jefferson. People shouldn't confuse differences of opinion with differences of principle. Uh, there are nine very strong people on this, uh, sitting around this horseshoe every Tuesday morning, and they all have different opinions on how the city should progress. However, there is no difference of principle. In my mind, the nine people who sit around this uh, horseshoe every Tuesday morning are, uh, are consistent and united and constant in their commitment to do what's best for Oklahoma City. Now, their differences of opinion arise, as I pointed out earlier, on how we might achieve that. But there's nobody on this council or the mayor who is not totally committed to the success of Oklahoma City. And uh, I just think I, I want to assure our citizens, although sometimes our discussions will get uh, robust, uh, active, 
as they should. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, everybody here has a, a firm commitment to making Oklahoma City the very best place it can be for themselves, for their families, and probably most importantly for the people who have elected them and given their, their trust to continue on doing the city's business. And I just wanted to make that point that uh, I, I think my colleagues up here are an outstanding group of people and committed, truly committed to the success of Oklahoma City. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilman Ryan. I, I personally want to echo those same comments. I, I, uh, I appreciate appreciate what you said, and I think that's well that's well taken. I think all of us believe that. Um, next item on the agenda is city manager reports. The first is a presentation on the uh, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. We have a presentation in that regard. Mr. Randall is here this morning. Mike Randall to, to, to uh, go over. A, a status report on the uh, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. He's got a handout that's push, passing out and a, and a presentation. Mike? Good morning. It's been 13 months since the United States Congress passed the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, also known as ARRA or ARA or the Stimulus Legislation. Uh, what I'd like to do is give you a brief update of what the city has received and where we are with the projects that are being funded by that money. Uh, city, either directly or indirectly, has been the beneficiary of approximately $50 million in recovery funds. Uh, as of the end of the calendar year, with our second quarterly report to the feds, we show that we have spent just a little under $1.5 million of that so far. But there's a lot of other funding in the pipeline, either with contracts that have already been led and work going on, or with projects that are getting underway at this point. And so what I'd like to do is bring you up to date on where those projects are now. Go ahead, Randy, next slide. Okay. Um, the planning department has been the recipient of several of these recovery grants, the first being the Community Development Block Grant Recovery grant. Uh, that was a total of approximately $1.4 million, and that's been broken out into several projects. One of them is uh, improvements to ADA situations at three libraries around the city, Capitol Hill, Wright Library, and Belle Isle. Uh, those contracts have been awarded. Construction on all three is supposed to begin in March. I, rec I found out that the, the Capitol Hill Library work has already begun. It started late February. Then there's also $700,000 for sidewalk improvements, ADA upgrades. In the area of Bodine Elementary School um, at 52nd and South Bryant, as well as a number of sidewalks around the downtown area. Bid opening is scheduled on that for next week, and contract is anticipated to be awarded in late April to begin the work on that. Go ahead, Randy. Um, additionally, $100,000 was allocated to Heartline 211 for the acquisition of some improved telecommunication and computer systems. Those have been purchased and have been installed and are in use now at Heartline 211. Uh, additionally, Healing Hands, Inc. was granted $100,000 of that funding for a homeless transportation van, and the procurement for that is currently underway. There is additional monies put together for the homeless in the form of another grant that went to the Planning Department, which is called Homelessness Prevention and Rapid Rehousing Grant, approximately $2.1 million for that. That provides essentially a full spectrum of services for families, and we're talking here about families with children that are low income, pretty much extremely low income. Most of the beneficiaries have been at about 50 percent of the city's median income, which for a family of four is around 20 to 24 thousand um, dollars. That includes legal counseling. It includes help with leasing information, tenant and and renter rights, uh, financial assistance where necessary housing location, as well as inspections of the residences before anybody goes into them. The contracts have been awarded to approximately half a dozen organizations, including the Homeless Alliance, the Urban League, Heartline 211, City Rescue Mission, Hope Community Services, Legal Services of Oklahoma, 
Urban Housing Locator, Inc., all of which work with these families either to keep them from losing a residence that they're currently occupying or to help them find a residence to get into to get them out of a homeless shelter where they're currently staying. Up to this time, 119 families have been assisted in this. 27 of those were actually homeless and were put into residential housing. The other 92 were families that were in danger of losing their residences and have been helped by this program. There's also to the planning department funds for brownfields assessments in the amount of $400,000, both for hazardous assessments and petroleum site assessments. So far, those funds have been used, one for planning of the cleanup of the U.S. Post Office site, and the other monies are basically uh, soil and water sampling going on at the downtown air park and at an OG&E site at Northeast 2nd and Lottie. Uh, in addition to that, the city has received a br money for a Brownfields Revolving Loan Fund in the amount of $900,000. Provides low interest loans to remediate contaminated sites. Up to this point, no money has actually been expended to that, but right now there's an application in process for asbestos abatement at the Dowell Center, which is what's pictured here, uh, for an amount of approximately $430,000 out of that $900,000. Additionally, the airports has received funding in the amount of just under $430,000 for Wiley Post airfield lighting. This is essentially an automated lighting control system. Uh, it's been upgraded. That project has been completed. The final closeout documents are being prepared and final payments will be made sometime shortly. Will Rogers is also the recipient of airfield lighting funds in the, for a project that will cost approximately $2.1 million, upgrades for the taxiways and runway. The construction's in progress right now. The completion date is projected to be September 2010. That project would have been done sooner. It's been delayed a little bit, partly because of weather and the need to use airports more uh, intensely during the winter months. So there's been some delay on that, but they still project a completion date of September 2010. The airports, Will Rogers, will also be receiving $4.1 million for a new closed circuit television security system to enhance the security at the airport. Money has been received and solicitation for the consultant is currently underway. City has also just this year created an Office of Sustainability which is implementing monies from the Department of Energy for the Energy Efficiency Community Block Grant Strategy, EECBG, uh, which is even worse than CDBG. As the names, as acronyms just get longer, it just gets harder even to remember what you're talking about. Uh, the first 250000 of a much larger grant, which I'll mention in a moment, has been used to develop an energy efficiency and conservation strategy. That strategy was presented to you in December of last year uh, and was accepted by the Council. What will happen with that strategy then is it's being used to implement the additional $5.2 million that's been received from DOE for a variety of energy projects, which include the ones listed here, city facilities retrofits that can include such things as lighting upgrades, uh, audits of energy efficiency, downtown recycling facilities, which will include recycling receptacles and some drop-off facilities, a bike share program, homeowner energy upgrades revolving loans, and a compressed natural gas fast fill station, which will refill CNG vehicles faster than most of the ones that currently exist around the city. Uh, most of that money has been, re of, of those projects have been reviewed by DOE, and we expect to be receiving those funds shortly. The only one that may take a little longer will be the CNG fast fill station, because it's got some additional EPA reviews that has, has to go through. But those monies should be in the city's hands fairly soon, and those projects should be underway. Is that site at the airport, Mike? Uh, I don't think so. I'm not sure if the site's even been selected yet at this point. I can check on that and make sure, but I'm not aware that it's been selected. There is a new site at the airport, which is a fast fill, but it was put in by private, uh, a private company. So there is a fast fill site. What's that? 
It will not be there. Here comes and Autumn here we to answer that very question. The, um, the CNG Fastville station is going to be at the Southwest uh, 15th and Portland Central Maintenance Facility. The application for the uh, energy uh, loans, will that be through the Office of Sustainability or is that through planning? Uh, it'll be through Office of Sustainability. Okay, there is some additional energy money coming from DOE, which will be handled by the General Services Department, which is money for city building energy efficient lighting improvements in the amount of $250,000. There is a match for that that the city had to provide. This was a competitive grant. Uh, and so using that match money, we already have begun the lighting efficiency upgrade RFP. We'll get a consultant to come in, help us do the audit of the lighting facilities, and then use the $250,000 for the improvements that they recommend. The police department is the recipient of two grants, first being the JAG grant, uh, total amount of just under $3 million. Of that $3 million, $2.1 million is going to be used for the projects listed up here. Equipment purchases, which can include a license plate reader, and a firearms training simulator, as well as part-time uh, positions to fund the ambassador program, keep it going, to provide the sex offender registration program, specialized traffic enforcement, gang enforcement. Uh, part-time and overtime positions have already been hired and are already operating those programs. Police are up. The rest of the JAG grant, which is approximately... Just, just a minute. I'm sorry. Do you have any... <clears throat> on the specialized traffic enforcement, is that a specialized, uh, like, traffic division? I believe it's just an expansion of the program itself with some additional positions to provide additional enforcement. Yeah, I'm not sure it's not just overtime pay. I can verify. I think it is. I believe it's just overtime. I, I think it's just over, overtime pay, uh, pay in targeted areas. Okay. It's part of the, that's a combination with the gain enforcement then? Or is it? I, 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 I suspect they overlap. That. I, I think, well, the Chief City's out of town, but I, I think maybe Chief McDonald's back there. We can have him come in and answer the question. We'll, we'll wait. Go on, While we're Mike. waiting, go, go on, I'll go ahead yeah. and talk about the rest of the JAG grant, which is about $860,000, which is allocated for equipment purchases from the other communities that are listed up here. Um, they would be using it for a variety of equipment to enhance their enforcement procedures, includes in-car video cameras, protective equipment, training equipment, a variety of things, some computer software, depending on the needs of each individual community. That's essentially a pass through. The city is the recipient of the money. It passes it through to these communities for their needs. Chief Shoup, can you tell us a little bit about the JAG grant? Uh, yes, uh, the uh, traffic enforcement is, uh, you were correct, is for overtime and selected targeted areas in the city with high, high uh, crash uh, statistics. And then you had another question about? Well, I was, I was trying to see if it was one of the coordinated programs with the gang enforcement, but it's literally in reference to accident areas that have a high high uh, percentage of accidents is there? Yes, sir, that's okay. correct. It's okay. uh, a completely different program than a okay. gang force. Okay. That's fine. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Police are also in receipt of a COPS grant in the amount of one point, a little under $1.4 million, and they're using those for the FACT program and the truancy program. Positions for the FACT program have been advertised and selections, I think, are underway for those positions to be filled. Truancy is basically using, has selected its truancy officers. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, the City Council approved the truancy ordinance and the agreement with School District I-89. The Utilities Department is in receipt, well, this one's a little more complicated because utilities gets their money through the Oklahoma Water Resources Board. It comes in the form of a revolving loan fund. 
of which $4 million is stimulus money, recovery money, which is to be forgiven. The city receives loans and that money will not be repaid. The actual projects involved are over $17 million, and so this, the Water, re Water Trust will be required to pay back all but the $4 million, but this is essentially $4 million that would otherwise have had to be repaid as part of a loan from the Water Resources Board. There are 11 different contracts that have been awarded at this point for sewer mains, sewer lines, water mains, at various points around the city. I can provide you a list of those locations if you want or it is on the website. But there's 11 of them. All of the contracts have been awarded. The water projects are in total projected to be completed in June of 2011, sewer projects in March of 2011. Public Works did not receive any money directly. What happened is that the State Department of Transportation received a large amount, I believe it's somewhere in the neighborhood of $60 million, and monies were distributed to communities throughout the state. The city is the beneficiary of some $15 million of that for city street resurfacing projects. Um, the actual contracts are managed by ODOT. The city essentially's only role was to select the locations for the work to be done. There are eight contracts that ODOT has let. Those are all underway. Construction is going on with those. Um, and my understanding is that most of that work should be done somewhat soon this spring. Some of those projects are close to completion already. So again, have, <clears throat> the, uh, the streets have already been identified? Yes, sir. I can get you that list if you'd like it. Yeah, I would like to see that. I'll do that. Okay. And finally, the Public Transportation Department has received some $10 million from uh, Federal Transportation Authority for a variety of projects that includes purchases of vans, facility improvements, which includes the Union Station facility, it includes the uh, 2000 South May Pro facility, the river maintenance facility at Exchange Avenue, uh, other capital expenditures, which will include some security equipment, an automated vehicle location system for its transit buses, and a variety of other upgrades to some of its activities. Um, currently, the river maintenance facility construction has been completed. The funding has been provided for Oklahoma River Cruises operations, and buses have been purchased for use in Edmond. Additional monies will be spent for the other projects, and those are coming online at this point. The city has also put in applications for competitive grants from the Recovery Act, uh, but has not had success at some of those. I thought I'd just mention those to let you know that we continue to look for additional funds and additional benefits to come to the city. Uh, several million dollars were applied for in competing grants for energy efficient and conservation projects with the state DOE. Uh, monies were requested for fire station construction of two fire stations which were not funded and the expansion of the neighborhood stabilization program which was stabilization program two was also denied by HUD. I think it's interesting to point out that they've established different agencies have established different criteria and for example the fire station constru construction dollars that were available out there one of their first uh, one of the first cuts on, uh, on their criteria was our unemployment rate in the area. Well, in Oklahoma City, we are the one or two as far as the lowest unemployment of any major city in the country. So we were weeded out on that point. So that's kind of a good news, bad news thing. The bad news is obviously we didn't get the, the dollars. The good news is we're not actually eligible to get those dollars because things aren't quite so bad in Oklahoma City. And those are the criteria that's established by the various uh, uh, federal agencies. Hold on. Your Honor, I have a question. This is probably a slightly unfair question, but I'll answer it anyway. Uh, part of the stimulus money was uh, allocated for high-speed rail transportation. And Oklahoma applied for a grant for, I think, $2 billion to do a, a link between Oklahoma City and Tulsa. I've been out of the city for some time, and I didn't know the status of that, whether the city of Oklahoma was approved for that or not. Yeah, uh, they, they awarded two areas in Oklahoma. Texas was not part of that. Uh, most of that money was on a lineup in Illinois, and the rest of the money was in Florida? I think that's right. 
So the Oklahoma portion did not include it? It was not. We also applied for some TIGER grants from ODOT, or not from ODOT, from the Federal Highway Administration to do a line from Oklahoma City to Midwest City in a rail line, and that also was not funded. And was that included in our thinking, at least, for our MAPS project that dealt with downtown transportation? Well, one of the things that was funded was a hub, and we're doing the hub study now, and so that was to enhance that if some dollars available, if to build the hub and to do any enhancements may be needed to supplement that TIGER grant application. So the absence of the TIGER grant, will that have an impact on our MAPS project? Well, the monies allocated for the transit have not changed, and so if there isn't a need for federal dollars, then it could be reallocated to some other needs within that program. I think. Okay. What was the amount of that TIGER grant application for the Midwest City route, Jim? A couple million? No, no, it was more. It was in the $30 to $40 million range, I think, Mr. Bowman. I don't remember the exact amount either. I'm sorry, but somewhere in that area. Because our thinking at that time was with that grant, if we needed to, to complete that line with a much, much smaller amount of MAPS money, we could accomplish it that way, but not envisioning the $30 to $40 million. No, no, no. We were looking at a few million dollars to tie that into our system and perhaps build a small hub. That's what a couple million is. Yes, sir. Any other questions? Mike, Mr. Kelly asked for a copy of the streets. I know that was provided to council some time back. I've forgotten. I think it might be helpful if we all just had a relisting of those streets. I'll make sure everyone gets a copy. Councilman Kelly? Yes. Were there any funding sources, I mean, any funding available for the court systems? None that I'm aware of, sir. I just find it kind of interesting. You know, under the JAG grants that some of these programs obviously is going to have a major impact on the operations of our court system. I know if the truancy program is effective as they expect it to be, it's going to increase some of the burden on our juvenile court or our municipal court. And I just find it kind of interesting that there's no proof, there wasn't any allocations or at least any programs to assist with the court system for staff. There were any number of programs that were just not included in the availability of recovery funding. Hard to say just what the thinking was on all of that. A lot of programs were available, but there were many. For instance, there was a strong resistance to any kind of recreational or park-related funding. That just didn't make it into the Recovery Act. As a matter of fact, there's some specific language excluding it. Excluding, yes. Museums. Any other comments? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Next item is a presentation on leading for results, mid-year performance report. Good morning. First, I want to recognize this is we're going to present information on the mid-year reports that should have been a performance report that should have been in your packets. I do want to recognize all the work that our city departments and city staff put into collecting performance information that they use in their management of their operations. We have a central database that they put information into that, and then we do regular reports that we'll talk about as we go along here. I also want to recognize the work of our staff in our office that they do. Joanna Ferguson is running the presentation this morning, and she is involved in preparing this report. And then Jason Fairbrush is a management specialist in our office who's responsible for the performance management program for our office. The leading for results performance initiative began in 2005. Basically, leading for results helps us to tie together strategic business planning, budgeting, and performance management. 
And an important part of performance management is performance reporting. Um, on a monthly basis, performance report reports are provided to the city manager's office on about 300 key measures. Within each department, um, th there are several departments that have 200 or more measures um, on average, and then we have about uh, 3,000 measures in total that departments are tracking. Well, 300 measures, um, an individual, at least one measure out of each program is identified as a key measure, and there's about 300 of those that are reported to the city manager's office on a monthly basis. On a quarterly basis, every measure is reported up. But this is a lot of information that we're working with. And then two times a year, we select high-level measures that are strategic results and key measures from the departments to report to the council. We do a mid-year report, uh, which is this report, and then also an annual report at the end of the fiscal year. Um, the goal of the Leading for Results program is to help us to focus on the results that our customers or our citizens receive. Um, strategic plan in our strategic planning process, uh, basically our strategic priorities are established by the council, and then those strategic priorities are used in our strategic planning process. Every department has developed a strategic mm -hmm. business plan, and then they update and review that plan every year. The strategic priorities established by the council are used as the departments prepare their strategic business plans, and then that strategic business planning information feeds into the preparation of our budget and the management of our operations. Um, Jason is going to come now and talk about the, some of the high-level measures uh, within the uh, report, and then we'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, good morning, Mayor and Council. Um, as Craig mentioned, I'm going to spend just the next few minutes um, talking about some of the performance information that's included in the report that you have uh, this morning. And uh, before we get into any of that specific information, uh, I did want to cover just a few things in general about the report. One is that this is the mid-year report, so um, the performance data that is, that is included is through the first six months of the fiscal year. So any time in the report where you see a, a year-end estimate or a, or a year-to-date number, that's the, uh, kind of a snapshot of through the first six months. Um, also, the report contains about 60 to 70 measures, and it, as <clears throat> excuse me, Craig had mentioned, uh, citywide we report on many more than that. However, again, the purpose of this report is to try to just give a general idea of the performance um, of the department and try to select measures that um, are from high-priority programs. Uh, if you have your report in front of you, um, you could turn to uh, page one, and I thought I might just give you a little bit of information about each department section and how to interpret the, d the data that's available. Uh, you can see on page one we start with the airports, and so each department section will have um, uh, the title of the department up in the heading, followed by an organizational chart of the different lines of business and programs within that department. Uh, and then under that will be the department mission. And then, that's when, and then next we start getting into the performance data. You'll see a table of performance data, usually uh, anywhere from three to five rows there of uh, performance data, followed by a, a, a narrative to help further explain some of the data that's in the table. Uh, you'll notice some of your departments will have an additional section titled strategic results, and the airport example that we're looking at here um, does have that additional section. And a strategic result is essentially a, a performance measure. However, it's a performance measure that really has department-wide implications. A lot of times a strategic result will actually take, you know, it will, it will require many areas of the department uh, in order to um, see success with that particular measure. So uh, just a little bit of uh, information on, on how to use the report. Uh, we're going to go ahead and start getting into some of the uh, specific uh, performance information we don't have all departments um, highlighted in the presentation this morning, but again, we did try to look at some of the more um, high priority programs. Uh, the first department we're going to start with is the city manager's office. And uh, within the city manager's office, there's the economic development program. And so one of the um, objectives, of course, to, in that program, or one of the ways they measure their success, is in terms of um, the new jobs they create, working with the chamber to create new jobs. Um, specifically, um, the goal is to create new jobs that pay higher than the Oklahoma City MSA average wage. So if you look at the top part, portion of the slide here, you can see that through the first six months of the year, the um, average wage for the jobs that have been created is actually about 1% um, below um, the average wage. And um, 
and even further than that off the target the department had set. Now, I don't think this probably comes as any surprise to anyone um, considering the current economic condition that we're in and um, there, you know, just not a lot of companies willing to relocate and expand at this time. However, I do want to mention that this doesn't mean that there are no new jobs being created or that there is um, you know, no companies that are willing to relocate and expand in Oklahoma City. In fact, um, if you look at the bottom uh, left portion of the slide, you can see we've got a couple years of history in here in terms of new jobs created. And you can see that uh, through six months of the current fiscal year, about 1,400 new jobs have been created working with the chamber. And so that has us really right on pace to just about meet and possibly exceed uh, where we finished in 2009. Um, now, as we've mentioned, these new jobs that have, have been created have not necessarily paid higher than the average MSA wage, but there are things that the program does to try to influence um, the ability to attract those higher paying jobs. And one of the things is through incentives. And of course, um, in order for a company to qualify for incentive, they have to meet uh, certain criteria, and one of those has to do with wages. So if you look over at the bottom right hand of the slide, you can see we've got a little bit of history there also of the companies receiving incentives. And so far, at least through the first six months of the year, uh, two incentive agreements have been reached. And I'm told by the department that just recently, actually within the last two months, a couple of additional incentives have, uh, have been agreed upon. So uh, we're expecting to finish this year at least at the level we did um, last year in terms of um, getting those incentives with companies that are bringing the higher paying jobs. Uh, the next department we're going to look at this morning is development services. And um, this is the first time we've had development services as a department in one of these, um, these type of reports. As you might recall, um, development services is a new department this year uh, that was organized by taking um, subdivision and zoning from planning, the development center from public works, um, animal welfare and code enforcement from neighborhood services and creating the development services department. Uh, I'd like to look at two measures this morning in development services and the first one uh, is from the building uh, inspection program and one of the ways that uh, this program measures its success at least in terms of uh, customer satisfaction is how quickly they're able to turn around their building inspections and specifically they have a goal to try to get all of their inspections uh, completed within two, or I'm sorry, 70 percent of their inspections completed within two working days of request. As you can see uh, in the top portion of the slide, the department is just a little bit shy of their performance target uh, for uh, the first six months of the year, but I would uh, like to go ahead and point out the chart we have down here in the bottom left of the uh, slide to give you a little bit of history on the uh, on how this measure has performed. And you can see uh, over the last three years, we actually do have some, steady, some steady improvement in performance, although they still have not achieved their performance target. Now, when we're talking about building inspections, um, again, with the economic environment that we're in, it's probably no surprise that there has been a little bit of slowdown in construction and so forth. And so that drives the number of building inspections uh, down. And as you, as you can see in the bottom uh, right portion of this slide, We've put up here the number of building inspections just so we can kind of look at uh, performance in terms of getting them turned around in two days versus um, more or less the workload of the program. And so you see it, can, it has tapered off a bit. Um, one thing I would want to point out though is that um, this increase in performance may not necessarily be all due to the decline in the number of inspections because if we look at just FY09 and FY10 we can see that uh, if we continue the same trend uh, that we have had through the first six months in terms of number of inspections, we're on pace to actually uh, do a few more inspections in 10 than we did last year with just a slightly um, higher level of performance. Uh, the next measure uh, we're going to talk about in development services comes from the animal welfare line of business. Of course, uh, at animal welfare, one of their goals is um, you know, to get as many uh, pets either adopted or reclaimed by owners or um, uh, placed with various rescue um, services and so forth. And so they measure that success uh, through their live exit rate. And they have a measure, um, as you can see, a percent of live exits. Through the first six months of this year, they've actually outperformed their target by about 9%, reporting 44% uh, live exit rate. I thought what might help to uh, put this level of performance in a little bit better perspective is to take a look at the um, table 
in the bottom uh, of the slide. And you can see in the first row there, if we look at the percent of live exits, um, over the last three years, we've seen steady improvement going from 35% up to about 44%. At the same time, if we look at the number of animal intakes, we can see that relatively speaking, um, it's pretty level. So I think this is a good indicator of, you know, the increase in performance here is definitely due to, um, you know, some type of, um, you know, something that they're doing in terms of management of the program. Now, the department has indicated that, um, you know, specifically some of the things they're doing is they're trying to do as many um, adoption outreach events as possible. Um, of course, the designation by the ASPCA um, certainly didn't hurt as far as creating additional citizen awareness and involvement, um, and it's helping them uh, in their uh, relationship with the Humane Society. So all these things are kind of coming together to help them with their live exit rate. Uh, and then. One other thing the department shared with our office when we were putting this report together was that in October of 2009, the shelter adopted uh, 777 animals, uh, which apparently is a, a new record for them. So um, the adoptions are, are going really well through the first six months. Okay, the next department uh, we're going to look at is the finance department. And within the finance department, you know, we have a lot of internal uh, customers. We work with a lot of internal city departments. So we wanted to try to find a measure that really um, demonstrated, you know, how we're performing in terms of our interaction and, and the service we're providing to outside entities, um, citizens and businesses and so forth. So um, in the payment processing program, there's a measure that, uh, you know, actually looks at how soon we're able to make our, or how often we're able to make our vendor payments within 30 days. Um, looking at the top portion of the slide here, you can see that through the first six months, 83% uh, percent of all vendor payments have been made um, within 30 calendar days, calendar days or less. Um, and this is just short of the performance target of 85%. I did want to um, take just a minute to use this measure as an example, and because you'll see this throughout your report and even, uh, even a few measures we've already looked at in the presentation here, where just because the department is not achieving their performance target, it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, that that's a bad thing. And with this measure in particular, the previous two years, the performance target was 80%. As you can see in the uh, bar chart below, we exceeded the 80% in, um, or actually last year, so we bumped the performance target up. And so that's kind of a common theme. We will ask departments, you know, to try to set stretch goals. If, if uh, you know, you're confident you're going to achieve it or the target has been achieved, and for the next year, let's reevaluate that target and bump it up. And that's just an example of, or I think this is a program of an, of, as an example of steady improvement in performance. They achieved their target, they bumped it up, and um, are working to hit that next level. Okay, in the fire department, um, they have a strategic result, and that's one of those department-wide type measures that I mentioned earlier to ensure that by 2012, uh, the citizens of Oklahoma City will receive an emergency response uh, within six minutes, 70% of the time. Uh, looking at the um, information in the top portion of the slide, you can see that through the first six months of this year, um, the department is actually performing at about 65%. So 65% of the emergency responses um, are being uh, responded to within six minutes. This is a little bit under uh, their target. And if you look at the line graph we have at the bottom of the slide, you can see that it's also a little bit under historical levels of performance. So there has been just a, a bit of a drop off. Now I am told uh, by the department that a lot of this, if not all, is directly related to the closing of two stations, station six and station seven. Um, and what this means is that, you know, there are some cases where, um, Calls are being dispatched um, to stations that are typically further away than had six or seven, station six or seven uh, was open. So there's a few more calls that are actually taking a little bit more than six minutes than what we have had in the past. Now, as far as overall response time, you know, if you took all responses and, and got an average response time, that's still running about five minutes and 17 seconds. So there's still, still really strong performance in terms of average response times. There's just a few calls that are taking longer than the six minutes due to the station closures. Now, Station 6, of course, will be replaced by the Bricktown Station, and Station 7 um, is in the works now to, um, to, to, 
to become um, operable once again. In fact, uh, I believe Council just approved the plans and specs uh, for Station 7 last week. So uh, this is something that's not going to last indefinitely with these closures. Uh, the next department, uh, Parks and Recreation, you know, they've got a pretty diverse group of uh, uh, programs there, anything from the Civic Center to um, uh, their grounds maintenance. What we uh, looked at here, at least for the presentation this morning, um, is a, uh, a measure in the special events program for the recreation line of business. And the reason we wanted to look at this one is this is another measure that really uh, tends to key in on customer satisfaction levels or how the department is interacting or performing in terms of, uh, uh, you know, with citizens. Um, you can see that the uh, percent of permittees who are satisfied with facilities and services uh, actually came in through the first six months at 90 percent. And what happens here is uh, when the Parks and Recreation Department um, rents one of their facilities, and when I'm, when I'm speaking of facilities, I'm speaking mainly of like the, the party houses that are located at some of the parks, such as South Lakes, um, I think Will Rogers and some others, uh, you know, the a type of facility where you might have a family reunion. Um, what happens is when a, a, a citizen or a customer um, rents one of those, the department follows up with a customer satisfaction survey. And to date, they've got 90 of those surveys back. And so as you can see, um, they've got a 90% satisfaction rating. And I think that speaks, you know, not only uh, highly of parks and recreation in terms of how they maintain the facilities and how they maintain the grounds around the facilities, but I think also it speaks highly of general services, their building maintenance program, who's uh, responsible for doing, um, you know, any of the major repairs that are needed. Uh, the last thing on the slide here is this bar chart down here in the, in the bottom um, that just kind of gives you an idea of the workload uh, to compare to the satisfaction rating. You can see that the number of permits that uh, the department is issuing um, has grown over the last two years and if current trends um, uh, remain for the next six months, um, looks like uh, more permits will be issued in 10 than even um, 09. Now, I will say that the, the workload uh, measure we have down here at the bottom includes all permits. So they don't, they don't survey for all of these types of permits uh, because this also includes special event permits and so forth. Um, okay, so moving on to uh, police department. Uh, police department is similar to fire in that they have a strategic result that looks at response time. Uh, in this case, uh, the goal is through 20 or by 2015, 90% of the priority one calls will be responded to uh, within nine minutes and 30 seconds. A priority one call, I might remind um, everyone, is a call where, you know, essentially somebody's life is in danger, whether it's crime related and, or not. So that they obviously put uh, emphasis on the priority one calls. Uh, year to date, the performance is 73%. So 73% of the priority one calls have been responded to within nine minutes and 30 seconds as compared to a target of 90%. Now, again, I think this uh, target here is an example of one of those stretch goals that we um, talk to departments about setting. Um, if you look at the um, historical information we have at the bottom of the slide, you can actually see that although the 73% that we're achieving year to date is under target, it's actually an increase in performance over uh, what we've done uh, the last two years. So, uh, again, an example of uh, improved performance even though the target is not being achieved. Although that's another example of where the target was uh, increased over the last couple of years. Yes. Yes, this target has just recently been increased, yes. Uh, in the Public Works Department, we've got two measures we're going to look at. Um, the first one comes from the Technical Review and uh, Regulation Program. It has to do with the percent of customers that receive an initial document review uh, within four weeks. Um, you can see that uh, so far year to date, they're turning these um, document reviews around in four weeks 89% of the time, about 9% higher uh, than what they have targeted. And I'll say that, you know, although four-week turnaround time may seem a little bit lengthy to those of us that are not, uh, you know, involved in the review process, um, this is kind of a, a, a multiple review um, process. I mean, they'll... Uh, when they do the initial document review, as the measure indicates, they'll look at drainage, they'll look at paving, they'll look at ADA compliance. Um, I think there's some cases where they may even go out to other departments. So it's a four-week turnaround time, but I think the advantage to the customer or in most cases, or the developer in most cases, is that they're really dealing with kind of one point of contact in the city for 
these various um, initial document reviews. The second measure we're going to look at in public works comes from the street ma uh, streets program and uh, has to do with the percent of potholes that are repaired um, within three days of complaint. And these are uh, really just looking at those, um, those repairs that come in uh, as a complaint. Um, so far year to date, um, the, the department is achieving 87% of these repairs uh, being completed in three days. That's about 7% higher uh, than what they've targeted. So through the first six months, they've, uh, they've really performed well in this area. I will mention that for the second half of the year, we could anticipate some decline in performance, uh, really due just to the sheer volume of potholes that um, they repaired in Fe uh, January and February. In fact, if you look at just the numbers, the amount they repaired in those two months is close to, very comparable to the amount they repaired the first six months combined. So with that much uh, increase in volume, we could see a decline in the performance, whether or not we'll be under target, it's probably a little bit too early to tell. And then, of course, the bar chart here at the uh, bottom of the slide would just kind of give you an idea of the, um, the number of these complaint-based pothole repairs that the program performs each year. Jason. Yes, sir. Jason, this is one area that a council person can have a very practical application and, and oversight on, because I think we all call them in from time to time. And I find it unusual if any council people differ. I've yet to find one that's been longer than three days that I've personally called in. I just find it consistently within two days over the last couple of years. Each time I've called and then gone back. I'd be surprised, again, if any council people had any different experience. I think it's very, very well attended to. Okay, the last uh, department we're going to look at this morning is the utilities department. And uh, again, we, we looked at a measure that tried to show um, how the department is providing service directly to the citizens. So we looked at a measure in the customer service line of business, and it's a percent of utility customer calls resolved on the first contact. Obviously, when a uh, citizen calls in, um, the more often that you know, the department can resolve their issue on the first call, the higher level of service that uh, is being provided. And so they measure that accordingly. As you can see through the first six months, the uh, performance is at 95%. So 95% of the calls have been handled really on the first contact. And I think really to kind of try to drive this, this level of performance um, home, we might want to look at the last 12 months worth of call volume that we have down here at the bottom of the slide. And you can see that really through December 08, through about May of 09, call volume really is is remained relatively steady around 40,000, and you can see uh, 40,000 calls uh, per month. And then if you look in June um, and July when the new billing system was implemented, and then look on even out into August and September when the uh, IMSA Total Care uh, program uh, came into effect, you can see the call volume really uh, spiked. So I just wanted to uh, try to pull this, um, this call volume in, really just give you an idea of the level of performance the department was able to accomplish during a time when they experienced extremely high call volume. That's the last department uh, we had to look at this morning. Um, be happy to answer any questions. Questions? Nice job. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I believe that's it. Citizens to be heard. Well, have, who's this citizen on the second row back there? Is there is that somebody that uh, needs to speak? The citizen second in the second row asked me not to embarrass him by introducing him, uh, so I won't introduce my grandson Ryan Kenny. Good boy, did he? He's visiting us from San Antonio. Uh, he just recently won a, a award as the outstanding uh, classical student, Latin student, in that district, and he will go to the state competition uh, later this month to represent his high school there. So I. Very proud of my uh, grandson, although I, he, I don't want to embarrass him by saying any more about him. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I believe that's it. We're adjourned.